today on the Run to the Top podcast. Most of the people who listen to this podcast are going, well, that's all great, but I just want to run. I want you to be able to run too. To do that, let's set you up to be able to run so when you're running, you can enjoy your run. And here's the thing. I want you to still be able to run when you're 55 and 60 and 70 years old, right? I don't want you to run just when you're 25. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Sinead Hockey. Hi, everyone. This is Sinead back with you again for Run to the Top's first episode of 2018, brought to you by Runners Connect. I hope you had a great holiday and you're off to an amazing year. Last week, we had a very special episode featuring Run to the Top's greatest hits of 2017. I asked listeners to share their favorite episodes of the year and a little bit about how those episodes impacted their running. And I got some really great responses. During the show, you'll hear those responses followed by clips from each episode. So whether you've been listening to Run to the Top since its beginning or you just got started a couple weeks ago, it's a great episode if you're looking for some new year inspiration. Speaking of which, on to this year. We're starting it off with a bang and speaking with one of America's leading physical therapists and the author of Anatomy for Runners, J.D. Sherry. Jay established his reputation as an expert in biomechanical analysis as the director of the University of Virginia's Speed Clinic. And now athletes from all over travel to his REP lab in Bend, Oregon, where Jay blends clinical practice and engineering to better understand the cause of overuse injuries. Unlike the traditional model of therapy, Jay's approach is pretty unique because he works to correct imbalances before they become a problem. Today, Jay will share a little about his new book, Running Rewired, explain how we can rediscover our body-brain movement patterns, and dispel the myths that pervade both the shoe and physical therapy industries. I can't wait to jump in, so after a quick break to thank our sponsor, we'll be right back with our interview. On this week's episode, we're actually sponsoring ourselves. If you're looking for a custom training plan, coaching support, and an amazing team of supportive, like-minded runners, head on over to runnersconnect.net forward slash train. There you can start your free two-week trial and add your name to the nearly thousand fellow runners we've helped achieve new personal bests. Again, that's runnersconnect.net forward slash train. We hope you join us. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you, Jay. I I really enjoyed my last interview with you for the Injury Summit, and I know you've been on Run to the Top before with Tina Muir, so so excited to have you on again. Excited to be here. Always fun. Yeah. Yeah, So, Jay, I want to talk to you mostly about your new book, Running Rewired, but before we jump into that, I kind of want to go back in time a little bit first. Um, When did you start running, and, and what sparked your passion for the sport? Sure. Uh, I, I started running uh, back in high school, um, not by, by by want, but by force. <laughs> um, I was a swimmer and basically, uh, you know, my cross country team was super strong and uh, coaches always looking for more bodies to um, kind of train and build a bigger entourage. And um, so, yeah, I basically was sort of like, um, yeah, <laughs> advised, advised slash force at Catholic school to, uh, to, to start running and, um, you know, just, yeah, didn't didn't love it because I uh, I kept getting hurt. Um, and uh, as a swimmer, you have great fitness, but don't uh, have a lot of the skills in in strengths and stability aspects you need to run. And so um, I think thus sparked my my frustration <laughs> and uh, and journey to find a better way. <laughs> yeah. So I, that was that kind of being injury prone while you were trying to run. Was that what kind of prompted your interest in pursuing physical therapy as a career? Yeah, entirely. I mean, I, I just, uh, I mean, to be honest, I got frustrated the fact, I mean, I was a, you know, a, a nationally ranked swimmer and, uh, and yet, you know, couldn't run uh 5k, you know, two <laughs> times a week without something hurting. And you go to the doctor's office and they basically say, well, nothing's broken. Don't run. And I just, I didn't like that answer. I thought that was ridiculous. Um, and, uh, I think that, you know, some of my passion and career 
or my passion for my career definitely was out of frustration for finding better answers uh, for myself personally, uh, and um, you know trying to you know build a better mousetrap and see see what this body can do. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, and then and then, yeah, and taking those lessons along the way, and then ultimately trying to help other folks, you know, accomplish our goals. Yeah, so. that's that's great. So. As you went through your PT schooling and everything, what did you ever figure out what was kind of the smoking gun, why you were so injury prone? Was there one weakness in particular that you had to deal with? Yeah, I mean, well, I'd say this. I mean, you know, it's interesting. And and PT education has changed a lot in the past 10 years. It really has. But, um, you know, when you go to school, you're basically taught by textbooks. And, you know, textbooks have stuff in there from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And you're taught by instructors, which are, you know, like, not everybody for sure, but there's a this kind of old guard of medical education and you know, all the stuff you have to learn. And so, you know, when you go to become a doctor or a physical therapist or a chiropractor or anybody, I mean, their goal is just to get you to pass a board exam. And there's so much stuff to learn uh, to just pass a national board exam that doesn't even get into any of the technical spe- mm-hmm. you know, specifics of the, you know, the kind of niche you want to practice. And um, so I, I definitely think that my eyes were open to some things, but um, I, I think of a, a big aha moment for me, you know, I came out of school and I started practicing and then you're like a deer in headlights because you know all this stuff and you're just dangerous because you know what to do. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that a lot of my frustration got even bigger once I got out of school and started working and found out all the stuff I was told didn't really work. Um, and then, you know, kind of just to jump ahead a few years, uh, we had a, a new research lab opening at University of Virginia. And the department chair was uh, open to my idea. My idea was to try and like, look at, you know, use all this great tools we had at the motion lab there to actually, you know, look at, you know, objective factors that drive injury and limit performance. And mm. I think that's when things started to uncover and unfold. And I started to learn the magic behind, you know, clinical exams and true objective numbers and see, you know, okay, look, if you're going to say something's better or worse, you know, measure it, right? So mm-hmm. show me somebody coming in baseline and show me you know, some type of intervention and show me some aspect getting better, right? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times we get frustrated, is this stuff worth my time? And I think that, you know, when I, I, I could ask people, myself two questions, right? It, the stuff I'm going to give somebody, whether it be a patient or a client or an athlete or whatever, is that really going to help set them set up, set them up for success? Is it truly going to make them better, right? And and so that that's the the tri- statements I try and get in the basis of what I'm doing is, you know, is this stuff really going to make a difference or is it just more stuff to do? Mm. So yeah, I say that's when those aha moments started opening up and I was like, wow, you know, when we see, you know, A, we see B, but not C. And then that, that's when stuff really became interesting for me. That's, that's so interesting. I know, Jay, one of your, you're a big proponent of quality over quantity. That's a, a big underlying message in your newest book, Running Rewired. And so I did want to talk to you about that. I know your book includes about 15 workouts that are specifically designed for runners. And uh, why, why, when you were creating those exercises and writing this book, why was it important for you to really put an emphasis on that quality over quantity? Is it why, why is it uh, not always that more doing more equates to accomplishing more, if that makes sense? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. I think that's one of the things that I, I struggle with trying to educate every single person I work with, whether it be, you know, through education stuff for you know, this book or do, you know, in a one-on-one kind of presentations or work with, you know, individual uh, you know, cross-country programs around the country. I mean, it's just... You know, if you back up and don't look at running, just look at like general psychology of training, right? So there's two types of learning, and I think it's important to understand this. There's deliberate practice and there's specific practice, okay? And you know, deliberate practice is breaking down your your sport and actually looking at what specific things do I need to improve to get better. And that's not just saying more mileage. And that's basically specific practice. And that's what most runners practice, right? They just base every time you run, you're practicing, right? And so, you know, whatever combination of mobility and stability and strength and power, you know, you bring as an athlete to the table, you put your shoes on, you have the door, and you just keep doing that over and over again. And you get really good at that one pattern that you've mm-hmm. ingrained over time, right? And so, um, you know, the problem is, you know, a lot of our discussion, you know, across all media channels for the you know the past 10 years or so has gone into this idea behind what's the best running form. And I think a lot of runners got frustrated because they tried to change their form, but they don't know what the heck to do, right? It's like, oh, well, shorten this, move this, try move more from your hips. And, you know, you try and get that person to move their hip and they can't even do that, right? It's, that's not even a skill set they have. And so, 
you know, when you look at trying to make yourself a better, you know, athlete, accountant, chess player, whatever, right? You know, if you look at what you need to do, you need to, you know, work on deliberate practice. You have to break that skill set down into essential pieces and nuggets and, and, you know, improve those specific aspects. And, you know, running more is not going to do that for you. You know, if you don't take quality time and say, look, what can I do to improve myself as a running athlete? And you practice those skills, uh, then you start to see, wow, I'm noticing I'm moving differently. Like, well, you know, when somebody says, oh, you know, run from your hips, like, oh, I get it now, right? Versus somebody telling you something, you're like, I, this doesn't click for me, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole idea, you know, I, I made a point in the book, you know, the time to worry about your form is not, you know, in the finish line of, mm-hmm. you know, your half marathon with your competitor breathing down your neck. Mm-hmm. It's like, you should you should have practiced it a long time ago, right? And and I think that time is now. And I think that, you know, this book is a chance to kind of take that, those lessons and, uh, and try and package them in a, in a you know, excellent executable, deployable, whatever, you know, cool word you want to use, uh, package for people to, to, to practice and, and get better. Absolutely. That's what I love about the book is how, how actionable it is and how much you've kind of broken down each exercise step by step. So there's very little room for error. And, um, with those exercises, like you said, you're kind of, you're kind of, they're designed to rewire your body brain movement patterns. And, um, I, I know that that may be a, kind of a foreign concept to a lot of our listeners. So can you explain what those movement patterns are and why we tend to lose them over time? Yeah. So um, I think just in a, in a bigger picture, it kind of set the stage here, right? So, you know, people say, oh, this book just has a bunch of exercises and it does have some exercises, but um, the, the idea is, you know, I'm not trying to get you to train a muscle. I want you to train a movement, right? And so when you think about, you know, the way we move, it's not just, you know, the way you run isn't dictated by the size of your hamstring or the size of your quad that has no effect on things, right? Um, sure, muscles create tension, which, you know, pulls our, our bones, which are our levers and drives us forward. Um, but the idea here is you, know, you have a neuromuscular system, right, that actually dictates how much, when, you know, the timing of all those contractions. And that's the skill of this stuff, right? That's why, you know, the person who runs the fastest isn't the person who squats the most, right? It's it's a person who can use their strength in a very efficient way um, to propel the body. And and so if you think about that from a big picture perspective, you start to say, okay, well, all right, well, then what do you need to train, right? And so um, I think that, you know, there's lots of stuff you can look at, but if you look at the, I think the biggest picture things, which, which I think runners just over, you know, just miss, right, are, you know, one, this concept behind core control, um, two, a concept behind counter rotation, mm-hmm. uh, and three, a concept behind hip drive, right? Mm-hmm. And and I think these are all aspects that teach us to move with precision. When I say move by precision, I mean just that, like to know how you're moving, feel how you're moving, and be able to replicate that, you know, not just in an exercise, but when you're actually running. And, and I find that a lot of the stuff, I was joking with one of my coworkers last night, I, this time of year, <laughs> I, I wind up seeing tons of athletes across the country who come back home, right, for winter break or come back to, you know, Northwest and they come see me because they've been having these injuries all year. And I think that I was joking. I was like, I think I'm going to write a new book called coaches, why the athletes you're giving your runners aren't working. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I mean, seriously, I'm, these coaches are giving great advice on, on a lot of stuff, but, but you know, they're being tasked with core exercises to get their athletes. And I'm looking at what these people are doing, these collegiate kids, and these stuff, they're way too hard, way too complex. Mm. And you're having people do, and it's not just these, you know, these collegiate athletes. I think a lot of runners are basically told in exercise and, you know, magazine of your choice. And it's a great exercise, but they're hard things. And you're not looking at, again, the quality in which someone's performing it. And it's just, you're, you're, you're asking them to, you know, perform a certain level and they can't. And mm. so, um, I, I find that, um, a lot of this stuff is, you know, from core control is breaking down core. It's not about, you know, how many crunches you can do. It's not about how long you can hold a plank. There's no correlation between time to hold a plank and running performance or running posture or anything, right? So it, it's, it's trying to break this idea of core stability down uh, in terms of, you know, way you know and can feel how to hold your body, you know, mile after mile. And so I think that's a big thing about core control. It's not just, you know, again, how strong you are in flexion or a plank, but it's dynamic stability, right? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I make the point in the book. There's, you're not going to find planks in the book. They don't exist because I don't believe in isometric exercises. You know, exercise where you hold a static position in a sport which you don't hold a static position. Mm-hmm. That makes mm-hmm. no sense to me. You know, um, you know, if, if running's dynamic, then posture is dynamic, right? It's going to change. You're going to be able, you know, changes. You run uphill, run downhill. 
uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's necessary, right? Um, so from a postural standpoint, I really try and wire in the idea behind, you know, feeling and finding neutral. That's, that's and I find that's, yeah, and I think that's something that gets missed, right? It's like we just, you know, we say, okay, we'll hold a plank or do a bicycle or whatever. Mm. And it's, just, it's easier exercises, which, you know, a lot of people tend to default to mover muscles, not stabilizer muscles. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's not strength, right. And to not just hound on posture the whole time, but, um, if, you know, you look at, you know, what defines postural stability, it's not how strong your core is, right. It's, it's all about timing. And so, you know, if you look at good postural control, athletes make a plan to move their spine under stability and then move some aspect above or below, right? So for example, um, if you look at a normal healthy person before I move my arm, before I move my leg, I've stabilized, you know, my core, my proximal kind of um, uh, position before I move my arm, my leg, right? Mm -hmm. And athletes with poor control or back pain, all these problems we see, those core muscles fire. They fire great, but they fire late. Mm, and okay. so would, why, yeah, so all those mover muscles still have to move. You still have to swing your arms, you still have to move your hips, but then your, your spine is uncontrolled, right? Cause those muscles act, you know, try to function too late and those bigger mover muscles overpower the stabilizers. And that's why we kind of get this pattern of, you know, out of whack and that pattern just persists. And I try and break things down and, you know, try and say, okay, look, we're going to train your core in a different way, right? We're going to basically, mm. you know, teach you how to stabilize under movement, um, and, and feel this position. And then, you know, through feeling that that's the same position I want you to do this exercise, more advanced exercises in drills that are in the book, in runs uphill and speed work, et cetera. And then, you know, you can run as fast and as hard as you want to until the point where your form breaks down. And that's, and that's how you really change form is by, you know, addressing the positive. So always thinking about what lesson do I want to teach a runner? And can I maintain that over and over and over again? That's deliberate practice. That makes total sense. And I, I'm glad you distinguished between ex- dynamic exercises and the static ones, how those uh, benefit running, it makes total sense that you would want to focus on dynamic in a sport where, obviously, you know, preferably you're, you're staying dynamic. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. That makes total sense. I never really thought about it that way. And uh, so, Jay, we we've talked about that how these exercises benefit runners from a performance standpoint a little bit, and I know. A large part of the benefit is also to do with injury prevention. So that being said, uh, I know that in the worst years, this is a sensational statistic, but I know it's true, is that um, up to 79% of runners will experience injury annually. And this is kind of weird when you think about it because we've evolved to run bipedally and you think we would be kind of good at it by now. So why why are injury rates so high today and what are kind of the biggest culprits behind injuries? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head is that we, you know, you said we've evolved to run and, and that's interesting, right? So I, in the intro of the book, I basically you know, put a case scenario out there. You know, I think Born to Run got a bunch of people excited about, you know, this whole idea behind, you know, being built to, as athletes to run. But the reality is, you know, these Taramar Indians, their lifestyle is heavily physically based, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you start to talk about, you know, these athletes that are just born to run, you know, they're literally, you know, tilling their own soil, they're harvesting crops, they're hunting down animals, they're like, you know, surviving on the desert. Running is their transportation mechanism, right? And then, you know, we basically, you know, watch Netflix and put a pair of shoes on and <laughs> hope for the best. And, and you know, it, I'm sorry, people, it's just, it's not going to happen for you that way, right? And, and so, you know, you start to look at, you know, what's the difference? You know, those Taramar Indians aren't born to run. They've evolved to run, mm-hmm. right? They, It's part of their, you know, you know, literally evolution. And so... I think one of the big problems we see is injury rates are we just keep throwing a bunch of volume, whether it's, you know, a 5K plan or a 10K plan or the runner's world plan or whatever it is. And you just throw a bunch of volume on top bodies that aren't prepared for it. Um, and it, it plain and simple, it's just, it's too much of the same thing in the wrong amount. And that, again, that, that's practicing more of that kind of, again, that specific practice, right? It's just a bunch of volume and intensity training, which is great to train your heart and lungs, but it doesn't condition your, uh, you know, your, your pulleys and levers, your, uh, you know, your, your bones and, and muscles and tendons and ligaments and meniscus and everything else to support that load properly. And, um, and again, that gets back to, we're not addressing skill development, right? Mm-hmm. We're just not getting people to, to, to think about, you know, what running is. I mean, um, you, you know, runners typically are, uh, 
just, you know, hounded by volume. But again, I try and change the discussion from, you know, what are you doing? What are you feeling? You know, how are you changing your run? How are you changing your body? You know, your body will drive your form. And, uh, and I, you know, I make that that case over and over again in the book. And if you can't, you know, if you can't feel your body to move a certain way, there's no way you're going to be able to change your form for the better. Right. So, um, it, it, it just comes down to, you know, building those running skills, you know, those running skills, again, are possible control. One thing we didn't talk so much about is, you know, this idea behind counter rotation, right? Um, you know, we always think about running a straight ahead, but there's a lot of counter twist to us as we run. Um, one leg comes in front of you, the opposite arm tends to rotate in the opposite direction, right? To kind of counterbalance this. And the example I always use is a, a pellet drum. You, mm-hmm. Those of you haven't, you've probably seen one if you don't know the name of it. It's basically a little drum. It's got a handle on the bottom and it has the two little uh, strings coming down the side with two little beads on it, right? And you kind of poke between your fingers and you shift it back and forth and the beads kind of go bing, 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 back yeah. and forth mm-hmm. and kind of, yeah, the reciprocal fashion. It's a great analogy to kind of think about the idea behind, um, you know, reciprocal energy exchange or, you know, a change in, in, in a twisting nature, right? And so, if you take that pellet drum and you kind of just, you know, walk down the road and kind of keep it in sync, it's nice and smooth and equal right and left. Um, and if you take that pellet drum and you kind of kink the handle a little bit, <laughs> so it's got a little bend to it and try and do it again as you walk, the the sink of those beads isn't in sync anymore, right? It's, they basically kind of go all over the place. And it's a great analogy to think about um, how we run because if you can't keep everything in check, what happens is the body tends to wobble side to side a whole lot more. Um, and so take home message, if you can't stabilize rotation through your foot, through your hip, through your spine, through your uh, upper back, through your shoulders and arms, arm swing, um, you're going to have a lot more lateral stress to deal with as you run. And I like to make running, you know, less stress per stride, right? I want to make mm. it easier. And you start talking about, you know, those, those uh, stresses which can, you know, result in injury. Uh, a lot of it comes down to not being able to either move enough or move the right way or, or you can't control that rotational torque through the body. And that's one of the huge reasons I see for a number of injuries. Basically, uh, all the... All the injuries that fall in the category of I can't stabilize my body really come down into a lot of that rotational plane stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, I really try and work on those. And then the other reason, yeah, I think the, the final reason we uh, can't see a lot of uh, you know, overuse problems uh, in runners is you know, deal with this idea behind you know, what muscles are kind of your, your quote, go-to muscles for propulsion. You know, mm-hmm. We live in a society which is very mirror-dominant. We love to work our quads and our chest and we, you know, we work things that are kind of in front of us and we, we neglect the things behind us. Um, and, uh, and so when you look at, you know, better running, it's being able to use all the muscles, right. Um, and, and be able to drive, uh, from the hip, from the knee, from the, from the ankle, um, called triple extensions, a fancy word for this. Um, but you want to use more of the muscles in the backside of the body. And, um, and the reason for that is it helps you kind of keep your, the swing of your leg sort of in check, right, uh, in relation to your body position. And, uh, again, so many runners love their quads. They know their quads. They have very strong quads, right? And so um, if you're a quad-dominant runner, it forces you to overstride, right? And you know, by definition, overstride is going to put more stress in your body per stride, and it's also going to hurt your economy as well. So um, we've got to do some steps to, again, you can't say, oh, well, you know, shorten your stride, right? That's what everybody talked about for a lot of years, and you're still hearing that a lot of people. And and for most people, it's a, it's a great cue, right? But what happens is, if you just say, okay, shorten your stride, you know, to run a, sh- a certain speed requires a certain stride length, right? And if you just tell somebody to shorten their stride, well, okay, great. They might shorten the front, but then that stride length got shorter, and then guess what? They can't run as fast, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it's, it's a simple math problem. To run a certain speed, you have to have a certain swing of your leg. Uh, and then, so you have people who are just, you know, artificially increasing their cadence to 190 mm-hmm. and five and 200. You can't sustain that. And they're saying, oh, well, I tried this stuff. I said in cadence and I tried to short my stride, but then my times went down and I couldn't run fast. So I gave up and went back to the old stuff. You know, it's not bad advice, but the way you, you know, you're, you interpret it or were told or whatever, right? That wasn't the right advice. So I try and get people to, you know, the over striders. Yes, they have to short the front side, but they also have to learn how to drive out the back. And that's mm-hmm. the thing which we don't you know it's, again it's not it's not talked about as much so um i really try and get that um, you know get people to tap into their hip um hip control and uh, again shift the propuls- propulsive drive from front side muscles to back side muscles and anytime you can spread the work of muscle the work out over more muscle groups uh in the right way that's 
always more efficient for any sport. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other thing is that it's important that, you know, about those hip muscles, uh, you know, they actually help steer and control the, you know, the wobble, that rotational energy we talked about in the body and, and the quads just can't do that. It's not their job. It's like asking your bicep tendon to do that. It just, it, it, it can't do that. So there's a bunch of reasons again, to work on those, on those skill development aspects. And I think those three things, um, you know, the posture control idea, the kind of rotation and the hip drive all fall into that kind of idea behind, you know, move with precision, right? Be able to control your body as you run. And that, that's the message I think it needs to get out there. Mm, that's fascinating. I, I do want to get back. You were touching on uh, cadence for a little bit there. I want to talk to you about that for a bit as well. But first off, you mentioned something that is so interesting, and that's that to reduce the stress of uh, the impact of running on your body, you kind of want to be able to recruit from uh, a lot of different muscle groups. You said kind of spread out the the stress a little bit there. So going off that, I know in your book, you actually, this is pretty shocking. You said that your body has to endure two and a half to three times your body weight every single time you step down. So what does that mean when it comes to strengthening. I know a lot of injuries are chain reaction injuries. Do a lot of them start from the, from the floor up? Is that kind of how it works? Um, it depends. I mean, so, you know, yeah, I mean, so there's, yeah, that's, it's a, it's a good point. And, and, and so just a few things in there, uh, number one, yeah, I mean, I always tell runners, I, you know, while you think that, you know, running is low loads applied for a long period of time, that's complete BS, right? I mean, it's, you know, you're having to control two and a half or three times your body weight. So if you're a 135 pound woman runner, you know, you've got, you know, 300, 300 pounds, uh, you know, basically every single stride you have to support. And that's how much is load is placed on your bones, tendons, ligaments, muscles, everything. Right. Um, and the reality is you have to be able to support that load and whether you like it or not, that's, that's reality. And so, you know, being able to think about that much stress in your body, you know, running is a lot of load applied for a long period of time. Right. So runners do have to be strong. And, um, I, I think that that, you know, knowing that it's like, okay, well, wait a second. If I think about running that way, I'm going to take a step back and think about what am I doing? Okay. Well, I'm going to do clamshells. Okay. Well, great. Again, clamshells are good exercise to kind of think about getting your hips to fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, that falls under that, you know, skill movement idea, right? What about, you know, body weight training? Okay. Well, great. Body weight's good too. But again, you're training for a sport that has to deal with two and a half to three times body weight every stride. Okay. Mm -hmm. Body weight training isn't enough to solicit the type of gains you need, right? So, you start working back, you know, that's what I like to do. I like to work backwards. What are the demands of the sport and how do you prepare for them? It's really simple, right? If you had a test to take tomorrow, you'd think, gee, what's on a test? I'll study that, right? And so runners go, oh, well, I'll just keep running, right? So um, I, mean, I hate to keep saying that, but that's sort of where we are. And I know most of the people who listen to this podcast are going to go, well, that's all great, but I just want to run. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what? I, I want you to be able to run too. And, and to do that, <laughs> let's help you win, right? Like yeah. I mentioned before, let's set you up to be able to run. So when you're running, you can enjoy your run. You know, and, and, I, and the, here's the thing. I want you to still be able to run when you're 55 and 60 and 70 years old, right? I don't want you to run just when you're 25. And, and so these are things that I think we need to be paying attention to to make sure your parts can survive, right? And so if you talk about that load of fly mile after mile, let's make sure you're ready for that. After the break, Jay will dispel some myths that surround both biomechanics and the shoes we run in. This is Sinead Hockey, and you're listening to Run to the Top at Runners Connect. Nod with me if you've ever been in the middle of a training segment and had to miss a few days because you either got sick or work got busy or you had to travel. I can pretty much guarantee that all of you listening have experienced this before. And that's where having a coach becomes really valuable. When life throws you a few curveballs, we can adjust your workouts so you're not falling behind and not doing too much to try and catch back up. We also do everything we can to make sure you get the most out of every single workout. And that's just one of the awesome features our training plans have. We also build in strength workouts completely custom to your weaknesses, injuries, and goal race distance. Each workout you're assigned comes with in-depth instructions, and we of course build a training plan completely around you. 
No templates, no modifications needed on your end. Just a training plan written to your strengths and weaknesses and designed to help you achieve your goals. If you want to check it out, head on over to runnersconnect.net forward slash train and start a free two-week trial. We hope you join us. We are back with Jay DeSherry. And Jay, getting back to Cadence, I wanted to talk to you about that as well. Earlier, you said a lot of people will strive to kind of hit that 180 strides per minute zone. And I think this is something that has kind of become ingrained in us as runners. We've kind of been led to believe that that's kind of the optimal cadence for everybody. This is a myth that you dispel in your book, and I kind of wanted to talk to you about that. Why is that 180 number not really optimal for every single runner out there? Yeah, so for those of you who don't like science and just want to look at realistic stuff in sport, which there's a lot of people like that, and I'm one sometimes myself, uh, let's just back up for a second. World, runner, world records have been have been won uh, with cadences between 172 and 212. Mm, wow! <laughs> so if you just if you don't want to talk about this whole thing, cadence, you think it's stupid. That's fine, okay. But if you look at what's what's winning, right? It tells you there's a range of effective cadences, okay. Um, and you know, some listeners say, "Well, I don't care. I'm not going to run a world record." But I think it just you know, there's a range of sort of optimal activity, right? And so. Um, you know, cadence is something which I think has been mashed in our throats. I mean, the the real thing we're going to look at is, uh, this gets a little researchy, but basically it's the storage and release of elasticity in our in our tendons, which are rubber bands, right? Um, and so the idea is the right cadence for you is dependent on a bunch of things, okay, that have to do with, you know, the contractile proteins in your muscle and the type of the, the tendon lengths that you've got and, you know, a bunch of things you can't control, okay? And some things you can control. Okay, uh, body weight uh, makes a difference here. Uh, gender even plays into this. Uh, we well, can't control gender so much, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so g- gender's there a little bit. And then the you know, other thing is this thing we can talk about later called rate of force gener- generation, which is how quickly you can train your muscles to apply force down to the ground. Oh. But all the all those kind of characteristics come into you know, figure out the most optimal time on the ground. Um, and, you know, increasing cadence or shortening your time on ground is not always the best answer. Uh, there's a great article done, you know, uh, uh, trying to remember the exact date. It was a while ago. It was like before 2000. Uh, basically say, you know, your time on ground should be as long as it can be until the point where you minimize elasticity. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this trend behind shortening ground contact time at all costs is actually not smart and actually uh, forces you to uh, generate more force in a short period of time. And I mentioned in the book an experiment we did with USA Track and Field where we tried to force runners to um, have a, sh- a super short ground contact time and everybody in that study got hurt. Oh, interesting. So, so those aren't good things, right? So um, I think to, 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 Sorry, I got off a little, you know, a little research tangent, but um, the idea is, uh, you know, there, there are certain ranges. And if you if you are somebody who's got a cadence, you know, 156 or something like that, that's pretty low. Yeah, it's probably worth increasing your turnover. And I think you shouldn't go from 156 to try and nail 180 steps per minute. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, research shows that that's one, you're going to work really hard to do that and probably get frustrated and stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's better to increase percentages. So I'd rather have people work on five to 10% at a time, right? So if you're 156, we want to work, you know, up towards 162, 163 for a little while, right? Try and work on that for a little bit. When that starts to make sense, maybe try and bump up a little bit further. But, you know, if, if your cadence is around, you know, 170 or so, if, if you're, if you're, if you're below 170, it's probably worth taking it, taking cadence into account. But if you're above 170, I would even focus on cadence. Um, that's, that's and then, hmm. yeah. And the second thing is your, your cadence is going to change, right? I mean, those of you who are you know running uphill, you change your cadence. Downhill, you change your cadence. Uh, trail runners are going to change your cadence. Um, you know, surface changes, you'll change your cadence. With speed changes your cadence. You know, you're not going to be at 180 for you know, everything from a you know a nine ten mile to a 420 hmm. mile, right? It just it doesn't work from a math standpoint. Um, so Again, I think that if you're somebody who's got a significantly low turnover, it's definitely worth your time increasing that. But for you know a lot of runners, I think you know measure where you are. You don't have to count to um, you know 180. Just <laughs> running <laughs> along, you know, just look at your watch, okay, and then basically say I'm gonna count for 20 seconds, right? If you're hitting 30 foot strikes in 20 seconds, that's 
Yeah, again, by a single leg, right? That's going to be 90, which is 180 per double side. So, all right, you just do the math backwards from there. So, where am I hitting? Am I hitting, you know, 21? That's pretty low, right? So, factor, you know, see where you are on that scale and make a determination what you want to do. But don't stress about it. It's, it's one variable. It's an important variable, but it's just one variable. Mm, that's so interesting. And going off of that, I know a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misconception when it comes to, you were talking about the time spent on the ground. And I, I think, uh, would you say that has quite a bit to do with the message that runners should be running on their forefoot? I feel like that would be, that would kind of tie into the brevity of time on the ground. People really advocating that forefoot, forefoot strike. Is that something you would agree with? Um, I agree. The, the idea that forefoot strike and low contact time are linked. Um, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. As for, well, I guess my real question is forefoot strike. Is it, truly as important as as we tend to hear it is or is it is not that not quite as important? okay great <laughs> okay. um I, so here's the reality so um it is a bunch of uh work on this i mean from a research side from a you know again with myself acquiring data on thousands of runners uh over my career i mean i, I would tell you this um i really care about where your foot contacts in relation to your body mm-hmm. i don't really care how or i should say i don't really care where on your foot you land Okay. Um, it is possible to overstride with a forefoot and midfoot or a rear foot landing, right? And it's possible to stride close to your body with a forefoot, a midfoot or rear foot landing, right? Um, and so I don't really care where in your foot you land. Um, and you know, those of you who have tried to force a forefoot contact for a while, mm. um, you probably find that you can't maintain it for a long time. And it's mm. pretty simple. The muscles around the backside of the um, uh, the calf fatigue. And so um, they can't generate much force as you get tired. And so then you shift back towards a midfoot or a rear foot or whatever foot strike, right? So um, I, I think that um, foot strike is, again, kind of cadence. It's part of the puzzle for sure. It's not the keystone, right? Um, in, in terms of, um, in terms of athletic performance. And I think that, you know, yeah, trying to, you know, if you have a, have a super short ground contact time, I call it like the, the running on coals, right? So you mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, land very quick and lightly on, on your, on your, uh, on your toes as you run. I mean, try and do that for a 10 K or a half marathon. You mm-hmm. can't, right. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not something you can maintain. And it's also not very efficient. So, um, you know, there are certain runners who run great in their forefoot and can maintain a forefoot uh, contact style uh, uh, for, you know, half marathon, you know, 10K, whatever. There are certain people who adopt that for short distances and switch to contact styles, um, a little bit different foot contact style as they get tired for longer runs. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's just another variable to use. That's so interesting. I, I've always been a bit more of a midfoot striker. And I remember this sure. was back in high school. I, I had it in my head that I needed to be a four foot striker. So uh, I think it was one day I was, I was going for an easy run and just, you know, spent the first 15 minutes trying to stay on the, the tips of my toes, which was so <laughs> stupid. Thankfully I gave up on that long ago, but uh, that's, that's so interesting. It's so different for everybody. So totally. Jay, earlier you mentioned uh, a term called rate of force. How does that play into all of this? Yeah. So if you're looking for the Holy grail, like if you say like what matters, that's what matters. Right. So, and, and I think that if you, and this isn't just a running thing, this is basically all sports that have you use your legs <laughs> um, d- d- depend on this single characteristic. And, and again, this is uh, spans the entire research world. If you look at what defines athletic performance, it's this concept behind how quickly you can apply force down the ground. Mm-hmm. All right. And let, let's kind of l- through this a little bit because it's important um, to listeners. So if I said we're going to squat, uh, let's just say 200 pounds, right? Okay. So runner comes up, puts a bar on their back for the squat, 200 pounds. If you're deadlifting, I don't really care. Any movement you put a bunch of load on, you can say, okay, move the bar, right? So um, nobody's timing you on that, right? If you're a power lifter and you're trying to lift, you know, 700 pounds off the ground, nobody says, okay, you know, you have one second to do this or five seconds to do it. They say, lift the bar, hold it at the top, lower it back down. That's it. Right. That, that's the whole the whole task. So strength. Right. Is time independent. OK. Um, and so we're just saying, can you lift this mass? OK. Running doesn't. There's no link between strength and performance. It doesn't really exist. OK. And again, it's not just distance running or track running. It's all running into sports, everything from soccer to baseball to basketball to football, everything. Right. The single highest correlated variable, which lab dorks like me measure, uh, <laughs> 
is called rate of force development. Mm. So that says based on how strong you are, how quickly can you produce force down on the ground, mm. right? And so if you train, and this is not just a, you know, again, quote, get stronger. This is get more explosive, mm. right? So okay. if I train my central nervous system, okay, to deliver more force down in a shorter period of time, what happens is I put more force down on the ground, which means I rise up more, which means I'm covering more force, more, excuse me, more ground per step. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. And mm. so now, and so now what you're talking about is oh, increasing each step length from a few millimeters, a few centimeters. Okay. And now all of a sudden, wow, you know, that pace, which used to feel like a, you know, say 710 pace now feels like a seven minute or a 650 pace. Right. Um, and you're not working harder. You're actually putting more force down the ground. You're more, you're more efficiently using your muscles. And that's the key thing we try and develop. Right. And to do that, it gets, you know, this, this variable, it's like, you know, it's like anything, like what's the most key variable is a bunch of stuff under that, right? So kind of we're building up from Maslow's hierarchy of needs to be able to, if you hmm. use that analogy, right, to, to build that rate of force development, you have to have the skills to be able to move, you know, maintain core position under load, maintain a hip dominant uh, um, um, uh, muscle uh, recruitment, maintain uh, that counter rotation idea, right? And then hmm. so if you have those skills in your, in your, in your system, and then we talk about training the muscles in our body to develop more force to the ground um, in a short period of time. That's how you capitalize on economy, right? And that's the number one thing that runners can do. And I can tell you, if I have runners who come in who have never done strength training before, I measure this little thing called limb stiffness. And I can tell you how specific this is to you. You know, I'll be honest, most Younger athletes, right, are, you know, younger, I'm talking about high school and college, mm -hmm. you know, their, their bodies are, you know, they're, they're pretty lean. They're, um, you know, they're developing every day. They're constantly changing. Those runners, I, would, I wouldn't say don't need to practice this by any means, but most of their time needs to be spent on those precision mechanics, mm -hmm. right, and cleaning up and building those skills. But, um, you know, as you get into your 20s, uh, you certainly need to start you know, looking to, you know, ways to train your body to, to move more efficiently in terms of economy and performance. And, you know, once you start hitting your thirties and your forties, you're, I can, you know, you're leaving performance on the table if you're ignoring this message. Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, it's important to make sure that we're constantly, again, thinking about that idea about deliberate practice, right? What can I do to improve that rate of force development variable? It's, you know, take some time and, and, you know, plans in the book, right? But yeah. but it's it's really you know, learning how to to do a better job of this. That's so interesting. I obviously we won't get too much into this because uh, our listeners are gonna have to buy the book to to really see all the exercises here. But when it comes to it kind of sounds like to get better, you have to get better at at these other variables to really increase that um rate of force. You have to you have to first uh increase all of these um your mobility, your your strength and your core and so on. So Let's say, for instance, maybe a, a college athlete, they're in their 20s now, and they've had all this background of strength work. How would they go about increasing that explosiveness and that rate of force? Sure. No, it's, it's great. So there's a, you know, in, um, from a big picture perspective, you know, let's just make sure listeners understand this. This is not CrossFit for runners, right? This is mm -hmm. not strength conditioning for fitness, this is strength conditioning for running, right? And that, that's the key difference. I'm not, you know, put it, the, the prescriptions in this book have not been written to just, you know, make you generally fit or make you tired or fatigued or quote, get a workout in. They're targeted design, again, those specific adaptations of, you know, rate of force development. So there's a bunch of rules in here, right? Like, um, you know, uh, for number one, that safety reason, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, if you've got a lifting, and I, I kind of state this out in the book, but if you're new to, to lifting, we have some kind of just simple preparatory stuff you're going to do for a while, right? Until you really get the idea behind, you know, being able to squat correctly. And I even, before we even talk about that, I basically say, look, get a broomstick and a, right? And just practice, you know, pro squatting with a broomstick, right? And, and doing a hip hinge with a broomstick. If you can't do that, do not put weight in your hands. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's just like saying, I'll just keep running more mileage. It's like, don't take your problems and put Put 200 pounds on them, um, you know, take your problems and clean them up. So mm. um, I, I really spend some time making sure we kind of, again, get those precision mechanics built. But mm. once you're there, um, you know, again, let's go back to the idea behind strength, right? You know, I said before, nobody cares if, how long you take to move the bar. Well, for running, I do care how long you take to move the bar, right? So, um, and in fact, there's research to show those protocols on super slow lifting where you take, you know, five seconds mm -hmm. to go up or about 10 seconds to go down, all these crazy stuff you read about. You don't need to be crazy and fancy with this stuff to people. You know, it's, 
it's in fact I, I tell people I don't want you to take more than two and a half seconds to lift the bar up and lift and lower down. Oh, okay, and it okay. might be even faster that, right? So you know the weights you're selecting shouldn't be so heavy to point your straining. And the weights you're selecting should never be heavy enough to where you're fatiguing and your form is falling apart. Ever, 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 ever. Right. So again, we're taking those ideas on possible control, hip drive, and then we're saying, look, let's put a load on them. Okay. And, you know, athletes can learn this idea behind, uh, you know, being able to, you know, apply force down the ground. And, and for novice athletes, you don't need to do a whole bunch of crazy power stuff. You know, they'll, they'll with, with the, you know, the right amount of load and keeping body mechanics in check, they'll develop that rate of force development really nicely. Um, the runners who have, have had some experience, so the, you know, the folks you mentioned in the collegiate or the folks who had some lifting experience you may bring from other sports, uh, you know, or maybe you just practice some time in the gym, you know, it's, it's about, getting a plan that's going to, you know, again, kind of unify those skills to make sure stuff is specific to running. So, mm. um, I've got, I've got a bunch of things in here on when you should do some of those workouts because, you know, the most important workouts of your, of, of your week as a runner are those speed work sessions, mm. right? So, uh, or making sure you're not going to those sessions tired. Yeah. Uh, we're making sure that you're always recovering properly, right? That the load is not too high. Um, you know, the compound, I have some compound workouts in here. They're horrendously hard. Okay. Um, but they're very appropriate for people again. So your collegiate runners, your math, you know, your runners who've got it, you know, kind of a experience uh, of lifting or, you know, your runners who maybe started out at grand zero, but been kind of working with these plans for, you know, say a year or so, you know, you're ready to move on to the most, most challenging. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's this idea behind gradual overload, right? If we're applying a little more stress to the body in a control way for you know, over a period of time, the body adapts really nicely. Right. But, um, it's all about making sure you put again, the right amount of load at the right time. So that's one piece. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when and you're the second saying... piece, sorry. Go, go ahead. I was going to say the second piece is, you know, uh, plyometrics, right? So, um, you know, plyometrics are, are fun, right? So it's, you know, it's <laughs> nice to have runners, you know, doing some things where you're kind of working on some sprint skills, working on some kind of just crazy stuff I've got in the book with med balls and, you know, learning how to, again, get some oomph in your stride, right? And so mm. um, I think that there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, help and fun runners can have with these workouts, uh, but they're, you know, they're training very specific ways to drive from the hips as you're trying to move quickly. And so those are all part of that pattern behind wiring, uh, you know, wiring the body to move better. That's, that's so interesting. And I know, Jay, something that I, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, besides all this, it is related, but oftentimes we runners, we get, um, you know, we kind of fall victim to big, all, all the advertising of the shoe industry that tells us d different types of shoes can help really fix our form and help uh, help our performance when, in fact, the, you know, it's more important to really put emphasis on improving our body. So, which is really obviously what your entire book is about. So going off that, I know you've done a ton of research in footwear and I know it, it just seems like shoe trends have really swung from one extreme to the other. First, it was the minimalist shoe movement and now it's kind of more the maximalist movement. And, um, you know, a lot of those shoe companies do advertise their shoes as helping to reduce injury, helping to improve running form and so on. So what should runners really know about these trends and, and can shoes actually improve running form or is that kind of all a lot of gimmick? Man, that's a little question, isn't it? <laughs> I know. I know. Um, yeah. So, so I'll back up and just say shoes are tools, right? Um, you know, you can give me the best tool in the world. If I don't know how to use it, I can't do anything for you. Right. Um, so, you know, there's no magic tool. I mean, you see magic shoe. Um, <laughs> and so uh, the idea here is, you know, you need to spend time working on you. That's that's the mm -hmm. biggest piece of advice I can give. Now, you need a tool, right? You need a shoe. So um, what should you be in? I think, you know, the vast uh, amount of runners out there are looking to go and walk into a local running retailer and drop, you know, between 80 and 120 bucks and say, this thing is going to help me. Um, it, it's a necessary piece of equipment. And I wouldn't look at it as something that's going to help you. I would say it's something that's working with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you select the right shoe and at the worst case, working against you, if you select the wrong shoe, right? So, um, most people are in shoes that are too overbuilt. And, uh, and, and so it's, I mean, 
again, people always say, oh, the barefoot movement was stupid. Well, you know, look at what's on your local running retailer today and look at what was in the walls, you know, 10 years ago. It's a complete shift, right? Mm -hmm. And whether or not you believe in trends, that has still stayed. Even these maximal shoes that come out, they're very unstructured compared to what's in the wall 10 years ago. So um, it, some of these things are trends and some of them are, are not. They're actually, you know, we've seen things shift and we've gone, okay, let's call our bluff and why are we doing this? I don't know because the running retailer wants us to have shoes that are stability, motion control, and cushioned. And and, you know, again, people are inherently different and variable and you don't, you don't fall into a slot, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't walk into a room and say, Hey, I'm this type of person, right? Everybody has an identity. It's different. And you're not going to be just basically one category of shoe. So, um, I, I think that, you know, there's a need to have different categories of shoes. There's a need to have, and, and again, because people are different. People run different people, with different service needs, right? There's a bunch of things. They're different. The shoe for the 200 and, you know, 40 pound, uh, you know, masters Clydesdale runner is not the same shoe that 110 pound collegiate, uh, you know, women runners should be running it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a need to have lots of different things in the wall. Um, I think most runners do a, a disservice themselves because they found some shoe they liked, which is great. And so, you know, they freak out like all runners do. And they basically jumped on, you know, some retail blood site and bought 13 pairs in this one shoe. And they stuck them in their closet for the next 10 years. Uh, and you never gave yourself a chance to try anything else. Right. And so, mm -hmm. You know, the challenges of retail are hard. I get it. But you walk into, you know, the local store and they say, hey, what are you running in? And they basically kind of get the same shoe, one that are kind of pretty similar to it, right? And you never have a chance to try something that's really different. And I think more runners should try some things that are different. I think that um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of bad stuff out there, too. But, um, but you know, there's there's a need to have different shoes. Um yeah, you should be a different shoe for faster runs and slower and slower easy runs sometimes, right? So um, there's a bunch of things that kind of fall in that question. It's a little bit loaded, but um, I would say that yeah. uh, in general, less is more, and there's a need to have variety of footwear. And um, I would not say a shoe is going to solve your problems. I'd say it, it would work with your problems. Uh, but if most runners would say, hey, look, I'm going to, you know, dedicate some time again to building a better me. Um, I'm not going to be dependent on a shoe. You know, you're not going to be that kind of person who's like, wow, I, I get, you know, 200 miles out of this and then my IT band flares up. Well, let's fix the reason why you're having your IT band problems. You probably get 500 miles out of your pair of shoes before your IT band flares up. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you yeah, know, let's, or we're not having to flare up at all. So, yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. I know that was a very loaded question, but I, that makes total <laughs> sense. And <laughs> really it's, I was, I, I just, I find it so interesting all the, you know, all the misinformation that surrounds the shoe industry. And uh, you you really broke that down really well for us there. So going off of that, another question, and this will this will be my last one for you today, Jay, but I know you earlier you said that the performance therapy uh, world has kind of changed. Literature has has shifted dramatically over the last, uh, you know, after, after the last few decades. And so how has... How has that really shifted in your experience from when you started your schooling in performance therapy? Is there a lot of, um, you know, really new information in the works at the moment in terms of biomechanics? Is there something, a lot of uh, kind of misconceptions that have been dispelled over the years? Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons. I mean, one is, you know, a lot of the, the quote, you know, old school teachings have been based on old school medical models. And, and some of those things are still right, still valid. And some of them are different. And we just realize why, because, you know, the, this idea behind performance evaluation, right, using stuff like gate, gate labs and, and things that I have at my disposal um, are, are relatively new, right? I mean, there, in the past 30 years, there's, you know, we've had the tools to measure these things and we're finding out, wow, like, let's ask, better questions to figure out the answer to this. And you do your study and you're like, wow, that wasn't what we thought. Right. And so I think that, you know, you're, you're, we're, we're relatively, you look at science, right? We're in its infancy. The biomedical, the biomechanical research, performance research is, is still relatively a small kid. Um, and so, you know, when you have small children, they tend to do crazy things. <laughs> so, you know, I think that we're, we're learning a lot because we can measure things and test things and evaluate things we haven't been able to in the past. And so, um, yeah, I think that's one thing, you know, coaches will always say, you know, one of my 
I value him a ton. Joe Friel is a you know, legendary coach. He basically says, you know, research validates what won yesterday. Um, and I, and I, I tend to agree with that somewhat, but the reality is nobody in a you know, medical model is going to teach something that's unvalidated just because they think it might work, right? That, that's how trends come and go. So, you know, for, for something to become interesting, right. Um, and, and maybe valid in some coaching circles and to really pan out, you know, when you start to talk about, okay, well, what's the best way to do something, you know, no medical school, PT school, whatever, athletic training school is going to teach something they can't validate and stand behind. So to get studies to come behind those, you know, kind of sayings or isms or whatever you may, you know, read, it, it takes a lot of strength, a lot of movement to really mm-hmm. substantiate things. And, and that's not easy. You know, people say, why can't the running shoes just do a study and figure this out? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I do studies for a number of running shoe companies and a bunch of, you know, small firms and a bunch of uh, big picture thinker stuff and a bunch of, you know, I do more assessments for a bunch of different organizations and they're not cheap, right? I mean, it, it takes time and energy to do a study correctly. And, you know, people don't just run around doing research, right? I mean, we, we have, we have specific questions we try and ask and we try and do clean studies. Um, yeah, I, I had an email that got to me last week and somebody said, can you basically find a study that says X, Y, and Z? Cause I want to be able to make this claim. I'm like, that's not how this works. You know, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean that, that's not how reality works, and and so it gets to you know what you you know what you want to hear may not be always what you're going to hear, but I think to you know for us to do a better job, and we're still asking questions, right? We're asking questions every day, and um, I, I think that so I don't know, that's one part of things, and I think the second thing is I think you know we're in a really cool time where you know I've been fortunate in my career to have a motion lab, right, and then I've, I've got two I work with right now. And so, you know, to be able to come in and say, well, let's not just look at this basic idea, read a research study, but let's measure you, right? Let's see how all the stuff we know applies to you individually. And that's a really cool time for you to do that. And it's been the most powerful thing in my career is be able to say, you know, let's find out if you, what, you know, what you do need to change, right? And so, you know, right now that acquires obviously lots of toys and gadgets to measure these things, but, it, but it's a really cool way to do that. And I think that that's going to be a, a bigger driver, right? So instead of saying, you know, what's the best blood pressure for everybody, there's some variability there, right? And and to know where you are, you know, not just today, but over time, that gives you more information than to say everyone has to be 120 over 80, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a great uh, article I read recently was basically looking at like body temperature, right? And saying that, you know, 98.6 is not everybody's body temperature. <laughs> you know, there's some, again, there's some variability in that. And, and, you know, we think that everybody has to be 98.6, but that's not reality. There's like, you know, I think it's like three or three and a half degrees of span there, which are different. And you say, oh, it's only three degrees, but, you know, if you walked into your doctor's office, he says you're 101, you know, you may or may not have a fever, right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, I personally have been fascinated with this because <laughs> I'm not an 8.6. I'm like 97.1. Oh, interesting. Any thermometer. Yeah. So it's like, again, I think that it's interesting to be able to say, okay, you know, where's an average and then where are you, right? Mm-hmm. You're not average. Nobody listening to this podcast is an average person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it's important to take into account, yes, the science, but how does this stuff and apply to you? And I think that's where you are is the, the, the tough time of research, you try and control for a bunch of variables, but how do you identify what's unique about each person and make sure the stuff that you're disseminating applies to each person, not just a group of, you know, 20 year old college kids who happen to show up for a study one day. Yeah. Yeah. It it is fascinating how much our understanding of the human body really is changing year by year. And uh, so Jay, you, I know you do loads of research with this stuff and and with biomechanics and uh, performance therapy. Are you doing anything at the moment or do you have any research projects going on currently? Uh, yeah, a bunch of, um, yeah, always, always yeah. <laughs> uh, things going on. So yeah, we're doing some footwear stuff right now. And I mean, um, yeah, I always I mentioned before, but I think the biggest research project I do every day is doing individual gait analysis mm. with runners, right? It's to be able to figure out, you know, yeah, sure. Here's a message, here's a trend, whatever, but how does this apply to you? And I think that's the, the really cool stuff that I, I, you know, I love spending my time with because it's nice to see how individual people respond and making sure that the plans we're giving them respond in, a, in the way we want. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I thank you so much, Jay, for coming on. Um, we will link everyone to your website and to the Running Rewired on Velo Press so they can purchase that if they like. And um, yeah, I just thank you so much for coming and telling us how all this stuff works. It's fascinating. I've learned so much today, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. So thanks again. Oh, it's been awesome. You yeah, asked some great questions. So thanks a lot. You can get your copy of Running Rewired at velopress.com. And check out our show notes today for links to everything mentioned at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC489. 
As someone who gets runner's knee this time of year, pretty much every year, I have already been making great use of the hip strengthening section of Running Rewired, and I have a feeling this year might just be the one I get through the winter in one piece. Knock on wood. Before I sign off, next week we'll be speaking with the founders of the November Project, a free fitness movement that was born in Boston as a way to stay in shape during the cold New England months, and the movement now has groups in cities all over the world. It's going to be a really fun interview, so be sure to check it out. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope you're off to an amazing new year. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 